Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. What are some of the synonyms and the names for the Lord's Supper? Eucharist. All right. What is, well, let's just make sure we understand all these. What's Eucharist mean? Yeah, it means to give thanks. It comes from the Greek word to give thanks. And so the, to call it the Holy Eucharist or the Eucharist comes from the fact that in Jesus giving us the Lord's Supper, he took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to the disciples. So that's where Eucharist comes from. So it's kind of a funny thing because Eucharist has become the cool, trendy way to talk about it, the really liturgical way of the Eucharist. Oh, that's cool. But in fact, it's one of the... Um, least descriptive of the names for the, for the sacrament because all you're describing is the fact that Jesus gave thanks. It's the giving thanks. Well, that's pretty vague. But it, it's got a cool sound. Eucharist. Yeah. So that's why it's popular, I think. But it really doesn't communicate that much. All right, what else do we call it? Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. And why do we call it that? In fact, this is probably the favorite terminology used by the Reformers, the Supper. Sometimes they'll call it the Holy Supper. And so why do we call it that? Yeah, it's in the context. And because it's a meal. We eat. There's eating involved. And it involves yeah, the Passover context. Okay? Other names? Well, Last Supper gets very specifically into the, the, the giving of it. We don't usually call it the Last Supper. We're celebrating the Last Supper today. We don't usually say that. But you can refer to the giving of the first to the Last Supper, no doubt about that. Other names we use? Holy, Holy Communion, yeah, the most obvious one. Holy Communion. So what do we mean by that? What's going on here with the Communion? Because we are joined. Yeah, Communion comes on several levels, in fact. There's a Communion that's horizontal between me and my fellow worshipers, because we are joining in this one meal together, common bread, common cup, wine, we're together, so that you have this communion of the saints together. And then there's another communion at another level, right? Because we're communing with God, right? God is feeding me, and I with him, and we're in communion together. And there's yet one more, a third level of communion going on, which is one you will never think of, and I'll just tell you. It's the communion between the bread and the body and the wine and the blood together there in the sacrament. All these things are happening at once, so it's communion on so many levels. All right. Okay. What other name? Sacrament of the altar. Yes. Sacrament of the altar. <coughs> sacrament of the altar. Also another name for it because it's the sacrament that happens at the altar. And so it works pretty well. It'd be kind of like calling baptism the sacrament of the font, even though we don't usually do that. But sacrament of the altar because it happens there at the altar. So all of these are legitimate names for the Lord's Supper. None of them is necessarily better or worse than another. Sometimes you'll even hear it referred to as the Mass, okay, or going to Mass. And there are a few Lutherans who are kind of reviving that. Um, I don't, I'm not that fond of that because Mass is kind of a funny name anyway. Mass, no one's really sure exactly where it comes from, why we call the service Mass. The one theory that comes closest is because in the Latin Mass, because in the last Mass is always said in Latin, at the end of the service, the... Um, Priests would say, Dimitere et, me et messi, or something like that, in missa, which means it, it's finished. In other words, we're done. So uh, what would happen is when the mass was done, the priest would say, okay, that's it, everybody go home. And so when he would say, it's mass, then they, everybody knew, that's it, the service is done, I've done mass for the week, so I can go. So they start calling the whole thing mass. So mass really has no spiritual connotation, no indication of anything, so that's why I'm not real fond of that terminology at all. All right. So what, whatever we call it, what we have in mind is what, what's going on when we celebrate the sacrament of Christ's presence with us, the Lord's Supper. And let's just kind of walk through this thing. There's oh, so much to talk about, and we'll try to get it done in a somewhat systematic way here. So what are the elements involved here? Go through our threefold criteria. What are the elements? Bread and, Bread and wine. wine. Okay. <coughs> Bread and wine. And we have the promise of grace, right? Because Jesus says, this is my body given to you for the forgiveness of sins. And Christ says, do this in remembrance of me. So we have the bread and the wine. And so the words that go with this will be the, we call these the words of institution. 
And so what we say for the words of institution is we have Christ, actual words, and sometimes, in fact, if you read much stuff, you'll come across this term. They'll talk about the, the verba, or the, the longer term, ipsuma verba. And I think there's two S's there. The ipsuma verba, which means the very words, the words themselves. Verba means words, and ipsuma, the very words. So the words themselves. So the ipsuma verba means you're quoting what Jesus said. So this is why we have the kind of the set thing. When we say communion, on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it. He gave disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. That's the ipsum of verba. That's the verba. So the verba should be at the sacrament, and the bread and wine should be at the sacrament. And Luther makes a big point. There's one other thing you need to have at the sacrament, which is kind of different, is the eating and the drinking. And so you actually eat and drink, and you consume the things, and then that makes the sacrament the sacrament. So you have the bread and wine, the ipsum of verba, the eating and the drinking, that makes the sacrament the sacrament. All right, oh, where do we begin? So much. Let's just start at the front. So, what kind of bread? Does, usually unleavened. Why? Because, of Passover. because it came out of the context of the Passover meal. So they were celebrating the Passover, which meant that they had unleavened bread at the table. And that's what they were eating. Because what are they remembering? The Passover. Passover. This is something we have not done a very good job of remembering. And of late, it's kind of become in vogue to have the Seder meals. And a lot of Christian churches now have Seder meals in the springtime. Not a bad idea. Because what that does is it kind of forces you to get back into the context of the first giving of the sacrament, which was the Passover. And the connections here are marvelous. Really, quite nice. So it's the Passover celebration, kind of equivalent to, you know, the, the feeling the, the, of a family gathering for a holiday. Everybody's there. Everybody's doing the traditions, the words, the meal, the food. It's sort of like, you know, your Christmas dinner or your Thanksgiving, just the feel of it. That's what's going on here. That's the context. And the mood is one of gratefulness for God's deliverance. In the entire Old Testament, what is the greatest example of gospel that there is? It's the Passover. Because in the Passover, the whole Exodus event, what you have is God coming to his people who are trapped in slavery, meeting them in their need. They don't deserve it, but he does it anyway. And then he leads them out against the enemy through the, the waters of the Red Sea, through the wilderness, and into the promised land. And what you have going then with Christ is he takes that whole Passover context and event and he just pushes it open and pushes it further to a much greater reality. Because now you have God's people in bondage to sin and to death. And you have the Deliverer, the Messiah, the Moses coming, Christ himself, God coming. And you have the Lamb being sacrificed in the Passover, right? so that the people don't have the angel of death coming to their home. And so the lamb is sacrificed, and his blood is shed. And because his blood is shed, there is release, rescue. And the people are led through the waters of holy baptism, as St. Peter tells us, into the promised land of eternity with their God, the new life. The connections are just marvelous. And every one of the gospel writers knew it, and insisted on making the connection. John especially. Especially John. Because in John's account, Jesus is actually being crucified at the same exact moment that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. John's got it all worked out. He knows what he's doing. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. And he's being sacrificed even as the Passover lambs are being sacrificed in the temple. There's no doubt about what John's up to. And in John, there's also these other little clues. Remember in Moses, when he told the children of Israel to slaughter one lamb per household and then put the blood around the doorpost, how did they get the blood around the door? Hyssop. They used the branch of the hyssop plant, which is kind of like parsley, you know, pretty you know, flimsy that way. It makes a nice paintbrush. It doesn't make a very good staff. And yet, in the Gospel of John, when it says that Jesus cried out, I am thirsty, a soldier quick ran and grabbed a sponge and soaked it with wine vinegar and stuck it on a stalk of 
hyssop and offered it to Jesus. Why hyssop? What a weird plant to use. Well, there's obvious connections. John is making all the connections he possibly can, drawing it together. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's Passover. It is the greater Passover. And this is what Jesus even says. I give to you a new testament, the, you know, a new commandment I give you. So he, everything's getting pushed bigger and fuller. And so the Passover celebration is exactly the right context. And we do our people a great service when we remind them of that context and they see the Passover connections. Dr. Rob, the Old Testament prophet, you'll have the chance to have him, have him later on. I had him as a prof back at Ann Arbor when he was just starting out. For, he was my Greek prof. And um, I remember once he was talking about, when you go to communion, don't you just come back from the altar at communion and just, you can just imagine the, wall, the waters of the Red Sea on either side of you. Don't you always have that experience? And we all look at him like, <laughs> no, yeah, no, what do you mean? Think about the waters of the Red Sea. That's the last thing I'm thinking about. But see, he was exactly right because that's what's going on here. You're walking through the Red Sea, right through the valley of death and into the new life, through the death, into the promised land, and communion puts you in connection with that. It's a cool thing. And even our scripture readings for Easter pick up on this. A lot of our scripture readings for Easter, the Old Testament ones, are going back to that Old Testament of the Exodus. And I remember preaching one Easter when I was in the parish on a text about the Passover. And I remember people saying, what has this got to do with Easter? They were just all confused before I pre delivered the sermon. But then I pulled all the connections and people, ah, I get it. So we need to, we need to make it more about this and help make people remember that connection. John. Uh, you were talking about hyssop. Um, hyssop is a purgative herb. And it's used for fasting because it's a cleansing herb. Ah. It's taken internally to, to clean you out. Okay. Another good connection. To this day, you go right. to the health food store, get bitters, it's hyssop. Really? Good to know. All right. So, bread doesn't matter. Unleavened bread works well, but can't, does it have to be unleavened? Not necessarily, because bread can be bread. So is it okay to use leavened bread? It is okay. And every once in a while you'll be in a church where they like to use nice leavened bread and the big fluffy loaves. But you have problems there because sometimes it gets too big and you know, get a big mouthful and that's you know, not real discreet. You know, they're chawing on something. Or sometimes I've been in churches where they have them, um, like they were trying to use unleavened bread and they get this unleavened stuff and it's hard as a rock or you know, crumbles so you break a piece and it's all over the place. It just gets messy. So we primarily use the host, which is just flour and water, simple bread, primarily for the sake of convenience. But it really doesn't matter what you use. You can use anything you want. Pita bread would work nicely. It peels nicely and you know, tastes decent. But it really doesn't matter what you use. Yes? Well, I was thinking about the bread. Does it, does it have to be a wheat bread? And I have a reason I'm asking. So. Um, I'm not sure it would have to be. I think a barley loaf or a wheat loaf either one would be acceptable because we're just told that they're using bread. Now, I would have to do some checking. I don't recall for sure if there were instructions to the children of Israel of what kind of loaf they should make. I just think they're told to bake their bread without yeast and do it quickly. Um, poor people's bread was always barley bread, and the, the people who had a little more money would have wheat bread. So I'm not sure it makes a big difference. Where I'm going with that is rice. Yeah. You know, my, my daughter has a disease they call celiac sprue. She can't have wheat, oat, and barley. Okay. And so what I did is I bought the rice wafers. Okay. And so when she communes, she communes mm. with rice wafers because she can't have no, that's a good question. the wheat I, I would have to do some more thinking about that and do some digging into that to probably give a quick answer. I'm not sure what I want to say on that one. It seems to me... And I think a question similar to that was addressed to the, our department once, and I think um, Dr. Monteufel offered an answer, but I don't remember what it was. I have to do some looking. Okay? It's a legitimate question. All right? I saw another hand somewhere. I was just okay. going to say, sometimes when they, uh, one of the neat things about having, like, a loaf that they actually take it from is everyone's taken from the same. Yeah, you got the you one know, loaf. You got that symbolism, too. Yeah, the one loaf. And, yeah. and so that's why, you know, you get yourself a nice piece of pita bread, and you can peel it up and tear it up. And, Make sure you wash your hands first. So don't get grossed out. But yeah, I, I can see I can see that. All right. So what's the other part of it? Wine, fruit of the vine. Does that have to be wine? Is it? <coughs> okay. Technically, it's a fruit of the vine. Did Jesus use grape juice? No way. <coughs> no. Teetotalers notwithstanding. Jesus did not use grape juice. There's not any way possible that Jesus used grape juice because the grape harvest was in the fall. 
Passover is always in the spring. The grapes that they were drinking were harvested in the fall before. You put grape juice in a bottle in the Near East, and you don't refrigerate it, and what always happens to it? And it's right. It always turns to wine. You, there is no such thing as grape juice without refrigeration. So there is no way at all that anybody had grape juice at the Lord's Supper. It was water. Now, it was wine, but it was probably cut with water, because that's what they usually did. They would take the wine, and they would mix it with water, and they would do that. And so that was usually what they would drink. That was the common drink. Everybody drank wine, and because that was just what you had. Was it, you know, was everybody getting drunk all the time? No, it was cut with water, and they knew their limits, but that's what they drank. Yeah. Not to get you off topic, but it is kind of on topic. These, these Baptists that I ran into this summer that were just, they were giving it, trying to stick it to me or whatever. Mm. They said that, that Jesus never drank wine. That that Jesus, that it's translated, translated new wine, w- which means that it wasn't fermented. <coughs> and I'm like, I, I mean, I went back and looked at, it, it's o- oinos or whatever. It's same used there as it is used That's right. in drunkenness. That's right. They're, they're grasping these straws because they're stupid idiot teetotalers. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're, they're, they're trying to vindicate their sanctification hang-up because they can't imagine Jesus was perfect. He wouldn't do anything naughty like drink wine. And they're just being total, absolute idiots. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that, another that's right. Trip, that's right. And you've got... Paul saying, drink a little wine with for your stomach, telling Timothy. I mean, good grief. It's just no doubt about it. They drank wine, and it's not a problem. So the problem is not the use of the gift. It's always the abuse that's the issue. And they're just being so pinheadedly narrow, they don't understand that. This is the truth of everything. Is sex bad? No. Use it the right way. Is beer good? Fine. Use it the right way. Anything. Anything. Is marijuana okay? Sure. It's a good food for the pigs. You know, I mean, everything has its place. Well, I'd say that just because it grows like a weed all over Nebraska. I mean, you know. So, well, I can remember walking through marijuana patches up to my, over my head. You know, I, I can't believe it was in Nebraska even. They had huge patches of it out in the pastures. just grows all over the place. So everything, has, God gives us these good gifts. We can abuse them, then they become bad. See, that, that's, so. that's where my take was, but I, I never heard that before. Yeah, they're just, they are just grasping at straws. They're trying to pull out exegetical facts, but they don't have anything to base it on. As soon as the wine went in the bottle, as soon as the grapes went in the bottle, it became wine. And you just can't stop it. There's no stopping the fermentation. That's what happens. That's the way it is. So, Jesus drank wine, and it needs to be wine. Now, the other thing is, it was the fruit of the vine. I was in the Philippines once with a, with a group of kids. We wanted to have this Holy Communion on our last night. And I waited too long to get the wine, and I was trying to find some wine at the last minute. The Filipinos don't drink wine. I, they like beer. And I'm funny I had her on, and you have the, you know, your Asian kinds of drinks. But I could not find wine anywhere. I found a wine cooler, but it was made with apple wine or something. So we didn't have communion. So I couldn't find any. And I said, you know, a wine cooler, oh, it's got wine. But, you know, it was the wrong kind of wine. It was apple wine. Well, see, that's rice wine. It's not a fruit of the vine. And so, you see, even be careful with this. You know, you're in the church, and you have somebody, hey, pastor, I got my own homemade mulberry wine. It's really great stuff. No, I'd say that doesn't belong at the altar. He can give it to you for your table. That's fine, you know, but not in the altar. Yes? A lot of churches like to have grape juice or something in the middle for... Yes, they do. For the middle. In the middle of what? All those stacks of trays of those silly little shot glasses. That's another, that's another issue. Yeah. <coughs> um, so yes, anyway, yes, they do have, they, there is that practice of putting grape juice in the middle. I'm not in favor of that. Because I, I don't think grape juice is using the elements that God gave us. So I don't like it. Um, people talk about non-alcoholic wine, and I've got mixed feelings about that, too. Because I'm not sure if it's really wine. Now, maybe the alcohol content, maybe they call it non-alcoholic just like they call it non-alcoholic beer. That means it's less than 1% or something like that. So there's actually a little alcohol. It's just negligible. That I could probably live with. But see, I'm better okay with that. What I really like, though, is, is just diluting it. I think the way to go is you'd give them water with a couple of drops of wine. And I don't, haven't talked to very many people who think that's going to be a problem. Even medically, most people don't have a problem with that because the amount of alcohol is so small at that point, it's not a big deal. But see, they're getting wine. 
And that, to me, is the key thing. They're, you're not messing with the words, the, 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 the institution. So that's why I do not like substituting grape juice. I think you're messing around with it. And you shouldn't do that. OK? Red, white, white, Red, white doesn't matter, no. Except white tastes better. <laughs> well, depending on you. Depends on your vintage, yeah, and all that, and the kind you're buying. That's true. You're right. You're right. I've had white wine that makes me choke, and I've had red wine that makes me. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. Why do we feel like at the sacrament we have to buy the cheapest stuff we can get? You know, you know, talk to your altar guild and put some more money in the budget for that. Get some decent tasting wine. If you're in a little church, you can really go for it. I mean, get a get a nice get a nice vintage wine and make it incredible. Don't use wine that has been left over for a week or two. Yeah, that's true too. That's true too. It gets <laughs> gets not gets a little acidic. Um, the other th the thing with the white wine, actually, white wine kind of is nice simply because it doesn't look like blood. And then you get the, it has less of the symbol aspect. See, we have to, we're going to get to this in a minute. We want to avoid this whole idea of it's a symbol. And if it looks like bread, blood, well, it reminds me of the blood. Well, if it doesn't look like blood, so much the better. Because what you're getting really is Christ's body and blood, whether it looks like it or not. Okay? All right? Yeah, Todd. Right. Yeah. When the pastor places that on my hands, the yeah. wafers usually are stamped with a cross, and I always think of that when I take communion. Is yeah. That, that That's good. You're jo being joined to Christ, and that the sign of the cross there, or some even some of them I've seen are stamped with a crucifix. That's good too. I mean, you're reminded of the, the price Christ paid for you, and of your your unity with Him through the sacrament. That's good. 